Good morning. Our text this morning is Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all who were amazed and perplexed, and sorry, all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in those in these last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life, you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. <clears throat> now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent 
And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let us pray together. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for preserving this record of the first days of your son's church. We pray, Father, that you help us to discern your will in these words and help us, Father, to live according to the pattern that you've laid out through your son and through the apostles. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our text today contains the story of the formal founding of the church. Right? If, we, if we had to point to one moment in time and say that's when the church was founded, Pentecost is it. All right, Peter's sermon, which Luke records here in Acts 2, uh, is sometimes referred to as the first gospel sermon. Uh, and it's for good reason uh, that we sometimes call it that. Because for the first time, the apostles are publicly proclaiming salvation through Jesus Christ. Specifically through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. All right, so this is the beginning of all of it. This morning, I want, us to, I want us to begin at the end of the reading, because Luke gives us the end result of all of this teaching and all of these works that happen on Pentecost. All right, we receive the report of how the church gets started, but then we also get to see how the church begins functioning. Again, the end result of the preaching and the miracles what the church was doing, how they responded to the proclamation of the gospel. And what we find in verse 42 is that the church is together. Right? Luke describes their unity over this last part of the chapter. And he describes it first off in terms of their worship. Right? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. We might notice here, by the way, that most of the acts of worship are summarized here in these couple of verses. They're really all in verse 42. Devotion to the teaching or the doctrine of the apostles. right? Devotion to fellowship. The breaking of bread, which in the context of worship refers to partaking of the Lord's Supper. Prayer. So we've got, again, most of the acts of worship described there for us, just in a single verse. Luke also describes the church's unity in terms of their overall manner of living, right? Not just what's going on whenever they're assembled for worship, but also their, their daily conduct. Right? All who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing to the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. <clears throat> we should note here, by the way, that the collection for the saints is implied here. Uh, as they uh, have decided to hold all of their things in common together. Although we're going to find ex other examples, um, other churches in the first century, churches in the New Testament, 
that it's not necessary for a congregation to live together as a commune, uh, as Luke describes here in Jerusalem. Um, But this is one valid expression of church living. It's permissible and commendable for a church to live together as a commune, sell all their things, share everything together in common, um, but it's not required. But I want us to notice here, the result of everything that's done over the course of Acts chapter 2 is that in both their worship and in their daily conduct, the church is characterized by unity. They are together. They have everything in common. In fact, Luke uses uh, forms of this Greek word, koinonia, in both of these instances. First, in referring to fellowship, right, when it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, that's the Greek word koinonia, And second, when he says they had all things in common, he uses an adjective form of that, koinos. Uh, That word refers to partnership, to sharing, to mutual interest, to joint participation. In other words, the church is together, unified. And the reason that the church ends up that way is because the church was planned and proclaimed in that way. It's not an accident whenever people get together and share their stuff, right? Just basic experience ought to teach that. You don't find people accidentally sharing their stuff together, (laughs) uh, sadly. It's against human nature. Uh, But what ends up happening happens because it is planned that way and proclaimed that way. The message that we hear through Acts chapter 2 is a message of unity. And that will be our subject this morning, the unity of the church, where it comes from, what it looks like. I want us to begin, going back to the beginning of the chapter, with the miracle of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the apostles. Now, over the course of Scripture, both before this and after this, we find whenever The scripture is poured out on someone so that they receive gifts. We find there's all kinds of powers that the Holy Spirit can work through people. Sometimes it's just conventional power, like what happens to Samson. The Holy Spirit falls on him and he is literally powerful in a conventional sense. Uh, You find the Spirit being poured out on other men like Samuel and they begin prophesying. But on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit picked one power, the same power, to give to 12 men. We don't ever see anything else like this in all of Scripture. The Spirit gives a variety of gifts to a variety of people. And usually, whenever we read about it falling on someone, the the Spirit falls on, especially in the Old Testament, one person at a time. The the gifts of the Spirit are much more common in the early church, but again, there's a variety of gifts. Here, we have 12 men receiving exactly the same gift. The same thing repeated 12 times. That tells you that that gift is important in this context. It is the gift of speaking in different languages. Why does the Spirit want to equip 12 men with that one power at this moment? As the crowd is being brought together by the commotion of the Spirit's descent, everyone is shocked to hear their own language being spoken by these Galileans. Believers from all over the world had gathered in Jerusalem to keep the Feast of First Fruits. That's what Pentecost is. And they were all able to hear the apostles speak of the mighty works of God in their own language. That's important. There's a reason the Spirit is doing that. I want to hold on to that for just a minute and draw our attention to the first passage that Peter chooses to speak from whenever he begins preaching. All right, all of these people assembled have already heard the apostles proclaiming the mighty works of God in their own languages. Then Peter takes the four 
and begins preaching from a text out of the prophet Joel concerning the last days. God declares that in the last days, he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Now, we've just seen that God is pouring his spirit out. In fact, Peter is quoting from Joel to say, look, this is what you're witnessing today. God is doing this right now. Right? It's an answer to that question that everybody asks in, at the end of verse 12. What does this mean? Right? The fact that we're all able to hear this message proclaimed in our own language. And the answer to that is this text from Joel. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit. And they shall prophesy. I want us to pay attention there to what Peter has just said. Quoting from the prophet Joel. Pay attention to who God will pour his spirit out on according to the prophet Joel. He says, He'll pour His Spirit out on your sons and your daughters. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my Spirit and they shall prophesy. You look at the variety of, of people receiving the gifts of the Spirit. You've got young and old, male and female, servant and free, in a word, everybody. In fact, that's what God says at the beginning of the passage. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, everybody. The outpouring of the Spirit on everyone signals an even bigger, more magnificent work that God is accomplishing at Pentecost. We find it at the end of that quotation from Joel. Peter restates it as the appropriate response afterward. God says, uh, as quoted in Acts 2.21, It shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. At the end of his sermon, Peter restates it this way. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Pentecost begins the proclamation that God's promises are available to everyone, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, race, language, gender, age, status. God is offering his salvation to everyone. And that tells you, by the way, who the church is for who belongs in the church. That salvation comes through his son, Jesus of Nazareth. We get a a pretty basic proclamation of the gospel this morning. The, The point of Peter's sermon is to establish the basic gospel fact that Jesus of Nazareth is the son of God. God had already attested Jesus' greatness through the mighty works and wonders and signs that God had done through him. And David prophesied that he would be raised from the dead, which the apostles witnessed. Jesus, therefore, and Peter says this, Jesus is the source of the spiritual outpouring on display at Pentecost. Verse 33, Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Through Jesus, God's Spirit was being poured out on all flesh. 
Through Jesus, God offers salvation, which is why Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Salvation is for everyone, but it is only through one man, Jesus of Nazareth. And that is why we find one unified church resulting from the events of Pentecost. They are together because God has called them together into one church, the one body of his only son. They share their lives together because they share in the spirit of life. They share in the resurrection of Jesus Christ together. The moral for us today is that we must maintain the church's dedication to unity in diversity. What kinds of people belong in the church? All kinds of people belong in the church. How many churches do we have? We don't make many churches out of many kinds of people. We make one church out of many kinds of people. The gospel is for all, as the scripture today proclaims. Salvation is for all, and thus the church is for all. Paul summarizes it in this way in Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And let us remember Paul's warning to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1.10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to be my Chloe's people that there's quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? The call for anyone who is not a Christian this morning is to lay a hold of the salvation so graciously offered by God. We invite you to believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. Turn away from the life of sin. Confess Jesus as Lord. Be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins. <coughs> and be added to the one body of Jesus Christ, the church. If you're subject to the invitation, won't you come as together we stand and sing.